Welcome. The psychiatrist is in. What seems to be the problem, sir? Well, it's been two years since I last uploaded something on YouTube, and since I started university. And in that time, I haven't been able to cobble up much of anything video related. It seems that I lost my spark to create stuff as projects rise and fall and my coursework takes up more and more of my time and energy. You would think the release of Splatoon 3 would reignite that spark to create, which yes, it technically did. But the game released the day classes started again. And now I'm stuck in this purgatory all over again. What am I going to do now? Oh, hey, Chugga Conroy just uploaded. Okay, Marina, tell a fine people at home about the Temnodontosaurus. Wait, what? Never mind, I found my calling card. Well, I'm glad that's all sorted out. That will be five cents, please. So, yeah, this is Splatoon's secret sea monster. Just hanging out in a line of dialogue spouted out by Pearl. That in itself is quite surprising. But what makes me even more surprised is that no one, and I mean no one, has commented on this Inkopolis news quote ever since Schellendorf Institute was added to the game nearly five years ago. Guess it only makes sense since nearly everyone and their mother in the Splatoon community is either a competitive player, an artist, or a person who creates online content about the game, and not a paleontology fanatic. But eh, can't complain. Gives me a niche. Now, I bet a bunch of you watching right now must be thinking, what the hell is this thing? I've never heard of such a strange name in my life. Where does it live? Does this thing even exist? Can I eat it? Well, sad news for you, hungry viewer. You can't eat it. It's extinct. And even sadder news for you Splatoon fans, it's not a squid. It's not even a cephalopod for that matter. But good news, it did exist millions of years ago. And even better news, we have the fossils to prove it. So, without further ado, allow me to formally introduce to you Splatoon's secret sea monster, Temnodontosaurus. Oh, a uh, quick correction. It's not spelled Temnodontosaurus, it's Temnodontosaurus. Thanks for nothing, Pearl. So, what exactly is Temnodontosaurus then? As hopefully made clear earlier, it's not a cephalopod. It is, in actuality, a type of marine reptile called an ichthyosaur. Perhaps you heard of them. Ichthyosaurs were a large and highly successful group of reptiles that thrived throughout the Mesozoic era. They first appeared some 250 million years ago, near the beginning of the Triassic period and persisted for some 160 million years into the Cretaceous, where they ultimately died out around 90 million years ago. Like all aquatic tetrapods, ichthyosaurs are considered secondarily aquatic, since their direct ancestors were once fully terrestrial and reinvaded the oceans, the place where all vertebrate lineages can trace their origins to. They're sometimes mistakenly referred to as swimming dinosaurs, but these two groups of animals are not closely related, having split off from each other millions of years before the latter even appeared on Earth. Fossils of these animals have been found on nearly every continent, and they came in many shapes and sizes, ranging from the early, small serpent-like Chahusaurus to the later medium-sized and more streamlined forms like Sternopterygius and Ichthyosaurus to the whale-sized leviathans like Symbol Spondylus Yongorum, Shonisaurus, and our star, Temnodontosaurus. Yet despite their wide diversity, ichthyosaurs as a group of animals share several major characteristics that enable them to conquer the oceans. They possess hydrodynamic bodies to reduce drag, shortened necks, spongy cancellous bone to counteract compression, strong paddle-like fins that were once limbs for stability while swimming, a reduced pelvis, a tail fluke as their primary source of propulsion, a dorsal fin, and perhaps most amazingly, even in the earliest species like Chahusaurus, they all gave live birth. If these adaptations sound vaguely familiar, that's because you've probably seen them before in other aquatic animals, like sharks and cetaceans. 
Ichthyosaurs were essentially what you'd get if you metaphorically mashed a shark and a dolphin together. And also make it a reptile. Ah, but wait you say. Sharks are fish, cetaceans are mammals, and ichthyosaurs are reptiles. Very, very different groups of animals. How did they evolve similar traits for aquatic life if they're not closely related to each other? Well, congratulations! You're thinking like an evolutionary biologist. This is a textbook example of convergent evolution, where two or more groups of unrelated animals evolve similar traits and body plans in response to similar environmental pressures. Basically, nature copying its own homework. Hey, hey, c can we copy your marine bio assignment? <sighs> sure, just don't make it obvious. Jokes aside, now that I've filled you in on who and what ichthyosaurs are, I believe it is time to take a look at our star, Temnodontosaurus. Despite not having as much public notoriety as other prehistoric beasts, like the dinosaurs, Ice Age megafauna, and other extinct marine reptiles, Temnodontosaurus was still a very impressive and very important animal in paleontology. The discovery of Temnodontosaurus dates back to the early 19th century with then amateur fossil collectors Joseph and Mary Anning. Born into poverty during the French Revolutionary War, they helped their father, Richard Anning, uncover fossils to sell and supplement their family's low income in Lyme Regis, a town in West Dorset in England. Luckily for them, they were prospecting in one of the richest fossil locations in the country, the Blue Lias Formation which was part of the famous World Heritage Site, the Jurassic Coast. The first specimen of Tenodontosaurus, and also the first skull of any ichthyosaur ever discovered, was found by Joseph in 1811, the older of the two at around 15 to 16 years of age. Joseph failed to locate the rest of the animal, and was eventually taken up by his apprenticeship as an upholster. But Mary, who was only 12 at the time, found what was left of the skeleton a few months later, a section of the animal's torso, the shoulder, and countless ribs. The specimen was eventually sold, traded hands multiple times, and ultimately ended up in the Natural History Museum in London, where it still remains today. And it became a sensation. The uncovered remains of the ichthyosaur jumped up a lot of public and scientific interest and awareness of the age of the earth and the prehistoric creatures that once existed long ago. Keep in mind that this was a time when most people in Britain still believed in the literal interpretation of Genesis, that the earth was only a few thousand years old and that species did not evolve or become extinct. The simple idea of extinction, first coined by French naturalist Georges Cuvier, was met with extreme skepticism considering the lack of fossil evidence and the common beliefs among the scientific community and the public. But, the discovery of Temnodontosaurus's skull, along with other later finds in the 19th century, more or less validated Cuvier's idea of extinction since, well, they now had more evidence of creatures that no longer exist. Despite women not being allowed to join the Geological Society of London and not receiving all the proper credit for the fossil she discovered until after her death in 1847, Mary Anning became a renowned, self-taught expert in geology and anatomy and went on to discover more monumental fossils that fundamentally changed our understanding of Earth's natural history, like the first plesiosaur, the first pterosaur outside of Germany, and even more ichthyosaurs. Although I am not able to cover all her accomplishments in this video, Mary Anning is considered one of the most influential figures in paleontology, and is often, and rightfully referred to as, the Princess of Paleontology. And it all started with a chance encounter with our secret sea monster. Since the initial description back in the early 19th century, several species have been assigned to the genus name of Temnodontosaurus. In recent years, however, the validity of certain species has come into question and thus have become slightly problematic as to whether or not they belong under the Temnodontosaurus name. A major scientific revision is likely in the works as of writing this script, but for the sake of time and my sanity, I'll be primarily focusing on three species that I personally find most interesting. T. Trigonodon, T. Eurocephalus, and T. Platyodon. 
Trigonodon and Platyodon are most definitely Temnodontosaurus based on a recent analysis, but there is a strong argument that Eurocephalus is likely its own genus, but I'm including it anyway because it's cool. As mentioned in the discovery section, Temnodontosaurus was first found by the Annings in southern England, but since then, specimens of the genus have been uncovered throughout Western Europe, including France, Luxembourg, Germany, and Belgium. They all date to the early Jurassic period, between 200 to 175 million years ago, when most of Europe was a vast archipelago within a large shallow prehistoric sea, known as the Western Tethys. Of the three species I'm highlighting, T. platyodon was the most widespread, being found in all the aforementioned countries. T. Dragonodon specimens have been primarily found in Germany, but are also known from France and England, with one particularly large and complete specimen making news headlines in early 2022. In stark contrast, the only known specimen of T. eurocephalus was found in the cliffs of the Blue Lias Formation near Lyme Regis. Of interesting note, Eurocephalus and Platyodon existed at roughly the same time and in the same place in Lyme Regis, while Trigonodon existed much later in the early Jurassic. Just thought I'd point that out. All known species of Temnodontosaurus were very large ichthyosaurs. Recent size estimates of known adult specimens can range between 8.5 meters to 11.2 meters in body length and 2.6 metric tons to 4.5 metric tons in mass, with T. dragonodon being on average the largest, while T. eurocephalus and T. platyodon were more modest in size. To put this in perspective, they dwarf great white sharks and rival orca in overall body size. Their skulls were also quite large. I myself saw the original skull Joseph Anning found on display at the Natural History Museum in London a few years ago, and it was around 1.5 meters in length. It belonged to Temnodontosaurus platyodon, but other larger specimens from T. dragonodon, like this one in Bans Castle in Bavaria, can reach over 2 meters. In contrast, the only known skull and specimen of T. eurocephalus was considerably shorter at a meter long, but it was much deeper and more robust, suggesting it had a different dietary preference. And you know what else is unsurprisingly huge? Their eyes. See that ring of bone within the orbit of the skull? Those are sclerotic rings. They aren't unique to ichthyosaurs. In fact, most vertebrates, barring mammals and crocodilians, have them. These help maintain the shape and rigidity of the eye, which is especially useful in animals whose eyes are not spherical or have to combat extreme water pressure. In Tenodontosaurus platyodon, these rings can have a diameter of 25 centimeters, resulting in an eye roughly the same size, making it one of the largest eyeballs of any animal known to science, hence the thumbnail. Some other distinct traits the genus had include relatively long, thin, yet flexible bodies, narrow and elongated fore and hind fins, which were roughly the same length, three primary digits in each fin, and fused axis and atlas vertebrae for stabilization while swimming. Oh, quick side tangent, some of these postcranial traits set Temnodontosaurus apart from older Triassic ichthyosaurs. Well, specifically Platyodon and Trigonodon, no postcranial elements have been attributed to Eurocephalus yet. Unlike the ichthyosaurs that came before, Temnodontosaurus evolved adaptations that facilitated a special type of locomotion found in high-speed, long-distance swimmers, known as tuniform swimming. In tuniform swimming, most of the power is generated by the tail while the front half of the animal stays still, in contrast to the full body movement seen in anguilliform swimming, which most Triassic ichthyosaurs performed. In comparison to most Triassic ichthyosaurs, Temnodontosaurus had a shorter torso, a longer tail that now ended in a crescent-shaped tail fluke, and the aforementioned fused vertebrae for stabilization and increased strength. These pieces of anatomy both increase swim speed and efficiency, enabling Temnodontosaurus to travel vast distances through open water, which later, more advanced ichthyosaurs will eventually adopt and further modify through natural selection. As mentioned earlier, T. eurocephalus is the most divergent species of the three and is likely to be a different genus. But there are subtle differences between Platyodon and Trigonodon too. Namely, differing anatomy within their skull bones, and Trigonodon having these notches all the way down the anterior edge of his forefin, while Platyodon does not. I don't have anything else to say for this section and I want to get this video out, so on to the next part I guess. With all these traits, 
giant eyes, powerful jaws, and a sleek body plan for fast cruising, you'd think these creatures would make mincemeat out of, well, just about anything they can find. And that's because they did. Take a look at this exceptionally well-preserved specimen of T. dragonodon from this German museum I can't pronounce. This individual died with the vertebrae of a smaller species of ichthyosaur in its body cavity, likely a young Stenopterygius who lived in the same ecosystem. Whether or not it hunted and killed the young animal or simply scavenged its remains, this is clear-cut evidence that Temnodontosaurus was a carnivore. And given how it's often the largest species in the environments that it lived in, at least in terms of body size, it probably wasn't very picky on what it ate. Smaller marine reptiles of various kinds, cephalopods, namely belemnites, and fish, given their vast abundance, were all major dietary components of this apex predator. And like all apex predators, Temnodontosaurus likely played a central role in regulating the populations and behaviors of other organisms through their feeding, helping to maintain the balance and function of its long-gone ecosystem. But what was that long-gone ecosystem like, you ask? As stated earlier, Europe throughout most of the Jurassic was a vast archipelago within the western portion of the Tethys Sea. The sea itself was tropical and shallow despite its high latitude, due to a much warmer global climate with no permanent ice caps, causing sea levels to be overall higher than today. If I were to draw a contemporary comparison, Europe throughout the early Jurassic would likely be analogous to the Bahamas or Caribbean of today, just on a much larger scale. It is generally agreed among researchers that the preferred habitat of Temnodontosaurus was likely the open ocean, and towards the surface of the water column. This is backed up by its adaptations for tuniform swimming, an apparent absence of depth-related injuries like avascular necrosis, and the presence of various microfossils like dinoflagellates and oceanic cephalopods in the layers of rock Temnodontosaurus is found in, namely various kinds of belemnites and ammonites, Oh, wait, wrong ammonites. These ammonites. Speaking of injuries, while the existence in an endless swath of blue may sound serendipitous, life for these oceanic reptiles was far from harmonious. One survey analyzing 41 specimens of Temnodontosaurus highlighted numerous painful pathologies, including infections, fractured and rehealed ribs, and deep facial injuries, often more than one of these injuries occurring on a single animal. Injuries like these are common amongst apex predators, and are likely caused by aggressive interactions between other species, conspecifics, and even accidents via collisions with structures. Whatever the exact cause, these injuries, along with all I've discussed previously in this long-winded section, exemplify the tough, unique, and fascinating existence these creatures lived out all those years ago. And... This is where I was supposed to write a fancy conclusion, tying all the points I've since blathered about back to Mary Anning and why studying these animals is just so freaking fascinating. But I desperately want to get this video out soon, so... That's about it, I guess. Wait, that's it? For now? Yeah. Apologies for the abrupt ending, but I hope this video was satisfactory for you guys who watched all the way up until this point. I may not be an ichthyosaur specialist, but I tried my best to shed some light on an overlooked group of animals. And who knows? Maybe someone more knowledgeable than me will hop into the comments section and share extra wisdom about Temnodontosaurs and ichthyosaurs in general. Hopefully more up-to-date research on this amazing genus will surface soon. And when it does, I'll be sure to pin it in the comments section below, and we can all continue learning together. Special thanks to the people listed here for making this video possible. And extra special thanks to geologist and author of The Fossil Woman, A Life of Mary Anning, Tom Sharp, for providing clarifications regarding Joseph and Mary Anning. And of course, the citation list and all the paleo artists whose art I used in this video are listed in the description as well. As for what I plan to cover next, it's this thing. Anyone want to take a stab at what this creature is and what franchise it appears in? Hint hint, the coloration gives it away. Hopefully I'll get this video finished without another two and a half year hiatus. See you guys then. Um, excuse me sir, this scheduled session lasted an extra 19 minutes. I'll have to add an extra 95 cents to today's bill. Oh god damn it.